Hello everyone, this is Devin Thorpe, your host for the Your Mark on the World show and today we're producing the show for Forbes where I'm a contributor covering social entrepreneurship and impact investing and we have two of the most remarkable guests today to talk about impact investing. We have with us Gene Case, co-founder of the Case Foundation and Paula Goldman who is the Senior Director of Knowledge and Advocacy at the Omid Yar Network. So, uh, Jean, Paula, thank you very much for joining us today. Great to be with you, Devin. Likewise, well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Well, the pleasure is all ours. Thank you. So, Jean, tell us a little bit about the recent uh, roundtable discussion at the White House and the message that the National Advisory Board brought to that meeting. Sure. Well, just by way of context, a little bit of background there. Um, about a year ago, the G7 set up an impact investing task force, and each country had a national advisory board. Um, and I was privileged to sit on that. Paula was deeply engaged in that work as well, and I know she's going to talk about it. But we uh, announced our report and sort of rolled it out at the White House a few weeks ago. And I really thought that moment was a moment that demonstrated some of the momentum that we're seeing here. Along with the release of the report, we announced two billion dollars in new commitments around impact investing. And so to me that's just really emblematic of the kind of momentum we're seeing in the space that I think we're all feeling really excited by. Well, it, it is a huge trend. It is an important space. How did you get started in thinking about this, Jean? Yeah, so it's great that Paula is um, on this hangout with us because we've always been deeply interested in sort of that space where business, innovation, and changing the world can come together. And really, when you think about impact investing, that's what it represents, new ways to solve old problems. So we had done some different things, but there really were some very serious pioneers in this space that we turned to when we first got interested in it. And one of them was actually the Omidyar Network. They worked very closely with us and shared some of their lessons and their learnings that they had gone through as they got deeply engaged in it. But what really changed was a couple years ago we brought a dream team together including Sonal Shaw who had led social innovation at the White House and was at Google and Goldman Sachs before that and we said look we really have to go to school we have to understand what's happening in this movement why hasn't it scaled the way we want to why hasn't it gotten traction the way we want to see it get traction so the work here at the Case Foundation for some time was really just going to school on it and learning and Really what we found was it's a unique moment in time, right? Because you have this new class of investors emerging, actually a new generation represented by millennials, and they want more than a financial return. And then sitting over here is a new class of entrepreneurs who don't just want to build businesses, they want to change the world. So we see that as kind of like a perfect storm coming together, and we're super excited by it. And so we jumped in really, again, on sort of the shoulders, if you will, of a lot of pioneers who went before us in the space. Well, Paula, let's turn to you for a minute if we can and ask you to comment a little bit about some of the specific suggestions that the National Advisory Board made regarding potential for changing federal rules around investing to foster more impact investment. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, we embarked uh, a little over a year ago on this process of reviewing federal policy around impact investing and consulted hundreds of experts to come up with a report that we released a couple of months ago. And we found a number of a number of changes that could make a huge difference in terms of unleashing billions of dollars of capital for social good. Some of the ones that I would highlight are ones that are um, as simple as uh, taking another look at regulations, looking at outdated thinking, and rewriting them in light of this huge groundswell that Jean described around people that are actually wanting to invest for both profit and for social good. So one example uh, is ERISA. Uh, ERISA is the regulation that governs pension funds. And, you know, there's a really interesting parallel, right? So in the 1970s, um, the government made it possible for pension funds to invest in venture capital, said that it was prudent for them to do so, and hence the venture capital industry grew enormously and unleashed 
you know, amazing innovation and created lots of jobs in the United States and abroad. There's a similar tweak that can be made now around ERISA to simply say, hey, look, it's prudent to think about the social and environmental impacts of your investments as they affect your bottom line performance. And we think that could similarly unleash billions of dollars into the impact investing industry. Another example, um, there is some guidance that the federal government issues around foundation investments. So foundations have billions of dollars uh, in their endowments that they're able to invest. And some simple clarifications, some additional examples of what foundations are able to invest, not just for profit in their endowments, but for social good, considering their mission-driven capital, some simple clarifications there could make a world of difference. Um, so those are two examples, and I'm sure Jean probably has a few more that she wants to get into, or we could we just talk about also this question of um, how it is that the government can also use the bully pulpit to encourage this swell of attention and activity as well. It, one might argue that the White House has already started that just by holding this round yeah, table, but you're, you're right. So much more could be done by President Obama, for instance, in a uh, State of the Union address. But Jean, what do you want to add to what Paula was saying? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're really trying to do is recognize that for the most part, business has sat on the sidelines and investing in new companies that can address social challenges in a really innovative way has just not really reached scale at all. There have been foundations doing this and I know a lot of foundations that we talk to when we talk to them about thinking about other ways to make these investments to drive social change so we're talking beyond just grants now we talk about it like using all the arrows in your quiver and so we think it's an important change from a policy standpoint and what Paula just mentioned on this front is really just a clarification in the language and giving some good examples of what does that look like? It holds the potential to unleash billions and billions of dollars into new innovative social solutions in our communities. How do you feel, Jean, about definitions? One of the challenges I think many of us in this space feel when we talk about impact investing is trying to decide what qualifies. What, how, what, how do you like to define the social impact space so that it fits within your guidelines as a foundation? Yeah, well, I think our focus has largely been on companies that provide both a financial and a social return as part of their key charter. Um, but I completely agree, there has been kind of a definitional problem, a nomenclature problem, if you will, because some people include in the impact investing um, sort of category nonprofits. But typically, the things that we're talking about in this conversation today largely have to do with unleashing entrepreneurs to build new businesses that will address um, society's challenge and to deliver to shareholders not just a financial return but a social return through their core products and services and that's really the sector from a case foundation standpoint that's really the sector that has us jazzed. Let me drill down just a little bit to, to give you a specific example if, if someone were to say I want to build a Facebook for dogs because dogs are people too uh, and that's a, a dire need to help poor puppies who haven't had their own Facebook so far. How do you react to, to that as a social good claim? And how do you how do you figure out where social good starts and stops? You know, Devin, I think that's a really fair question. And I would say one some things we've talked about is intention transparency and measurement and so if the company is very clear in terms of what they're intending to do with a social impact that gives investors the opportunity to say this resonates with me or it doesn't but equally important is the measure of that social impact and the reporting out or transparency that needs to take place behind it. So you wouldn't outright want to exclude from the definition anybody who claims a social objective. You'd solve that problem by uh, addressing the transparency and the measurement and the, the intention, that synergy of those messages so that investors have the opportunity to make a selection not only on financial returns but also on the particular impacts and, and that will define it over time rather than creating a definition. Is that what I'm hearing you say? 
Well, I'll tell you what, we've been working, I, I, I want to make clear that I agree that there's confusion in the market and that confusion is not helpful. So clarity around this very point I think will be important to see scale. So we've been working with B Corps, for instance, to see if we could expand the definition of what a B Corp looks like, maybe a B Corp light. So I actually think we do have to get to a place where we have better definitions than we have today, but I think even when we do that, it's going to incorporate this intent, transparency, and measurement. Sure. I don't know, Paula, would you add anything? Yeah, I guess I, I would add a couple of points. Um, you know, number one, there are a number of iconic entrepreneurs within the impact investing tent that are just, you know, when we look at some of the stars that are rising, there's just no question about what the impact is that they're having. I think of companies like Revolution Foods, which provides nutritious lunches, and I think something like 75% of the kids they serve are in lower income communities. Um, I think of companies like D-Light that provide solar lighting to folks that have no electricity all over the world. There's sort of no question about the crystal clear impact that these folks are having. Um, and in fact, if anything, the most urgent need for the field right now is to encourage more entrepreneurship in that vein, to get more early stage capital to those kinds of entrepreneurs so that they're able to scale and grow and report back on the millions of people that they're actually serving right now. The second thing that I would say, um, just in terms of this range of types of activities and investments that are in the field, one resource that I think is excellent um, is the Guide to Impact Investing that the Case Foundation recently released. And it's accompanied by this set of examples um, of different types of companies and the different type of impact that they're creating. And I think for anyone looking to, you know, dip their toe in the water and understand what's under this broad tent, that's a really excellent resource. That's a great, great point, great reference. So, Paula, as you're approaching this at the OMIDR Network, how did you all begin your interest in impact investing? So it's actually a really interesting story. Um, so uh, as you as you probably know, so Pierre Omidyar started eBay, uh, and when eBay went public, he and his wife Pam um, found themselves with quite a lot of resources that they immediately dedicated to the betterment of humanity. Uh, and they started doing started out doing with what most do, which is um, a family foundation. And they made a lot of progress on that front. Um, and you know, it supported quite a lot of high performing nonprofits. And this sense started to um, to become clear to them that they felt like they wanted other tools at their disposal. They they wanted what Jean described as sort of the full set of tools, um, and including more market-based tools and for-profit investing. Uh, so they, around 10 years ago, created this hybrid entity called Omidyar Network, where we have a for-profit entity and a non-profit entity, and we do a about half grants and half impact investing at around $700 million of investing to date. Um, and, and that's kind of how we got started, was the sense of, based on the eBay experience, that for-profit companies can do a tremendous amount of good, can, in the case of eBay, create jobs for a lot of underserved entrepreneurs and innovative folks that wanted to get access to markets they would have not, you wouldn't have had access to before. Um, and sort of building on that example and looking at where entrepreneurs were explicitly looking to tackle social problems. So we've been at it for about 10 years and see not only tremendous gains in the field thus far, but tremendous promise waiting to be unlocked, which is why we're so excited about having the government as a partner in this journey. It, it is a great opportunity, and uh, I wonder if we could go back a little bit to the uh, regulatory opportunities. I think there were four or five specific suggestions in the report. You've mentioned uh, two or three. Do you recall the others that uh, were specifically called out in the report? Uh, sure. I mean, there was actually something like um, 30 recommendations. So uh, I, do, I certainly don't want to bore the audience, but we can get into a handful of others. Um, so 
you know, there was there was a general call for the government to review specific existing ongoing programs and agencies and to think about um, some of the thinking or restrictions which might be preventing greater impact. So another example in that regard, um, we did a lot of analysis on OPIC. The, um, this is the, the U.S. government's um, uh, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Right. And this, um, so OPIC, which has been operating successfully for several many decades, has been returning money to the Treasury for over three decades um, and helps you know get investment going abroad through US investors, has a bunch of restrictions around what types of instruments it can use for impact investing, right? It can't do early stage equity. Um, it can't invest in its own staff um, except for through a yearly appropriation. And there's some simple tweaks in that that will allow an already very effective agency that is creating enormous impact with disadvantaged populations to really accelerate that trajectory and still keep returning money to the Treasury for the U.S. taxpayer. Um, we talked a lot also about the way that the government could su help support uh, impact enterprises um, and how different types of impact organizations, whether they're nonprofit or for profit, should have greater access to existing programs. So here's another example. Um, the Small Business Administration gives loans for small businesses and has been doing so for quite some time. There is within this whole trend of um, impact-based organizations trying to find sources of revenue so they can scale, there's this trend of nonprofits that are finding revenue sources so that they're able to um, continue and become more sustainable and grow. Well, it turns out that nonprofits, no matter how much revenue they they earn, are not eligible to apply for these small loans. And I don't think that's intentional, actually. I think that's just a result of this kind of old thinking where we have on one side business and on the other side for impact we have nonprofits. And we don't think, you know, and somehow it was this thinking that these two worlds should not merge. And instead what we're discovering is that when these two worlds merge, tremendous scale and impact is created. And by reversing some small things like that stipulation about small business loans, we can, you know, do a lot of things more quickly. That's uh, great, great stuff, uh, Paula. Thank you for sharing that. Before we wrap up, Jean, I wonder if you would share with us just why this is so important to you at a personal level. Why do you care about this? Sure. Well, you know, the Case Foundation is 17 years old, and we say we invest in people and ideas that can change the world. And as we look out across our world, across our nation, across our communities, we see daunting challenges, and many of them have been with us for a long time. So we need new ways to solve old problems. And we do believe, without intent, business has been sitting on the sidelines entrepreneurs have been kept out and we just think the promise of new solutions and innovative work in the social space can really really be made more real by bringing entrepreneurs and business into the fold and so impact investing and the various policy things we've walked through and many of the things we've talked about in this interview we think holds great promise for benefiting society. Jean, how would you want listeners to engage with you as a result of listening to this show. Sure. Well, Paula, thanks for that nice plug about our um, guide to impact investing. And I should say it's a short guide to impact <laughs> investing. It's meant to be a quick read. So I would welcome anyone to come to the Case Foundation site, casefoundation.org, and take a look at that. Um, to, if there are investors watching this, to consider how they might jump in. And Devin, one of the things you know, you've been a leader in and a leading voice is around crowdfunding. There will be lots of opportunities for investors to play a role at all levels in this new impact investing space. And we would encourage them to learn more, jump in, and hopefully become you know, part of the big tent that we're trying to build here to change the world. Well, thank you, Jean. And Paula, how would you like people to engage with the OMDR network? 
Oh, there's there's so many different ways to engage here, and I think not just with the Omidyar network. Um, one thing is to you know download the report, um, the the National Impact Investing Advisory Board Impact Investing Report, and read through the recommendations. But particularly, one thing I would want to call out is in the introduction to that report, there is a description of the many different folks that are coming on board to impact investing. You know, from folks like Jean and Steve to um, foundations, to millennial entrepreneurs that really want to create on, uh, businesses with purpose. To take a look at those list of organizations as also a good guide to who's out there doing stuff that might resonate with people from various parts of the tent or who, who want to get into the tent um, and to get ideas that way to join us in this journey. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for being with us today. It's just a joy to have you. I'm grateful for your insights and wish you every success in the work you're doing. Thanks thank so much, you. Deb, and a pleasure. Okay. All righty. Let's do some good.